What's up, everybody? John Eric Poli here with my MMA news, and today's guest will be fighting Brad Tavares at UFC 276 on July 2nd. I am pleased today to be joined by Drake is D plus C. Drake, thanks for being here, man. Really appreciate the time here. It's going to be great catching up with you. I know we spoke after your last win. There's been a lot going on since then with fights getting canceled and whatnot. So it's uh, it's great to catch up with you and kind of clear the air on a couple of things and talk about this upcoming fight. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Always good to be, to be here. And yeah, a lot of change and a lot has happened. So uh, before we start getting into any of these specific fight-related stuff, I do want to actually ask you about the background right behind you. It's a pretty sick painting that you got going on there. So why don't you uh, first show that off for all the fans here and uh, tell us a little bit about the painting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was my first UFC fight when I made my day. Some designer made a cool artwork of it, and it looks pretty sick. It's a memorable moment. Uh, memorable moment uh, first UFC fight well for me it was uh, a dream come true to all the uh, years that I was trying to get into UFC and finding making them incredible yeah so uh, obviously I know that you have a lot of other cool stuff too right that jersey is a pretty cool thing too so go ahead and explain the jersey too it has your nickname on it number 69 you got that from the oh, United yeah. States too right yeah yeah we, we had the made the it's a song of 69 obviously the number so much right. Yeah, those fan jerseys, it's, it's pretty sick. It came up very sick. All right. So now we have all that cool stuff out of the way. Let's start getting into some fight specific stuff here. So, last time that we spoke was coming off your knockout win over Trevin Giles. Uh, you got an extra $75,000 for that. That was on, of course, the Conor McGregor card. So, the bonuses were a little higher. Since that time, you were booked to fight, I believe, uh, with four different opponents from December to April. Nothing ended up happening. It's got to be frustrating. It's got to be tough for you there. We'll start with the uh, Andre Moyes fight. I know he had suffered an injury that, or so you suffered an injury that kind of delayed that one to push some things back there. What exactly transpired with everything that happened there? Yeah, well, I mean, we signed a fight. It was a great fight. Everything was happening. It, was, uh, it wasn't even two weeks into camp. And I had, I mean, I've been struggling with the shoulder for a while. And uh, we, we kept an eye on it because it was a, it was a reoccurring injury, reoccurring injury. And then it, it came to a stage where for the past four weeks, uh, I can train for two days. Then it's, the shoulder is so bummed and I had to get it loosened up and, we just couldn't find the problem and uh, we had to go for the MRI and we went for the MRI and they said, listen, man, you, you need to get surgery right now. And uh, I was like, well, I mean, I'll do that after the fight. But then we gave it the, the two weeks and the camp started, everything was good. And uh, this, the shoulder just uh, was such a, such a big mess that every, every other day I would have to set out a session because my shoulder was too inflamed. And we just made the decision uh, after the MRI where the doctors, my, my team, my medical team just said, listen, this is not this is not a smart move, and you know I'm young. I have a long period of these uh, managing injuries, and uh, so it wasn't a massive operation. I was out for six weeks, uh, but you know it could have led to a much much bigger injury, which would have had me out for you know up to nine months. So it was a smarter thing to do, and even though I never won a count so far, it was it was uh, at that stage I was the so you mentioned right with the surgery, uh, only out six weeks as opposed to it could have also been nine months if you had it delayed. So obviously it was a good move getting that done there. How's the shoulder holding up now then after having the surgery? Everything's all good to go now and it's all better? Oh, man. Oh, man, it's so much better than before the surgery. It feels it feels great. Man. My shoulder was just uh, was a mess and uh, it feels great now. It's holding up perfectly. Uh, I mean, it's like I never even heard it. I, I felt great. Like from January, it was 100% again. I got uh, the operation early November. In January, when I started camping for the fights in April, I mean, it was as if it never happened. Well, it's good that it's somehow like modern technology and, and science, everything is now too, that you could have an injury like that and it comes back better than ever. So that's fantastic news there. So now Absolutely. let's get into the other mess of this whole entire, you having fights booked that didn't come through. So then, all right, so you had the surgery then, you go from not fighting, then in December you get fights now booked then for April. Three different opponents in that stretch. 
That has to be extremely frustrating. Before we get into the exact things with the Kevin Gaslam thing, there's another some words there. Kind of take us through this whole entire uh, thing that happened there with your fights in April and how you kept getting opponent uh, changes after another. Yeah, so I mean, the first fight was uh, scheduled against Chris Curtis, uh, which is an amazing opponent. Uh, I was, he was just an Ortega. He knocked out uh, <clears throat> Phil Hawes and he knocked out uh, Brendan Allen, uh, just like Kevin on the chair. So, I mean, that was a lot of hype behind him. And uh, <laughs> that was a fight they offered. And I was 100%. That was the fight to make. I was really happy with that fight. Uh, stylistically, it's a great fight for me in being a Southpaw. I fought a lot of high level striking in Southpaws. So, I was really comfortable with that fight. And then he got injured, but luckily, I mean, they said uh, Fluffy Hernandez, Anthony Hernandez, he was on the same card and his opponent pulled out. And, you know, you in terms of rankings or getting myself out there, but, you know, it's my, only my uh, third fight. I was completely happy with that fight too. I, I don't really care. I just wanted somebody to step in the ring. I mean, I was ready to go out there and, and perform. So whoever stepped in there, put in the part of me. We even, I even said, if there's nobody, I'll fight a 205 if I have to on short notice. Doesn't bother. But I mean, they got me the replacement, which was great. The fluffy fight would have been uh, an exciting one itself. I mean, he always comes to fight. I mean, record-wise, not the greatest, but I mean, he's beaten some big names. And uh, he comes to fight. It's an exciting fight. So I was really happy with that fight. That was another performance bonus coming. And then, uh, obviously, on the plane, when we landed with a lot of miss calls my phone from agents there and they said listen uh Calvin Gaston's opponent pulled out will I step up to take the fight well I mean that was that was it I was like well 100% that's even better I, I mean I was ready to face anybody like I said whether he was in the top 10 top 5 or number 30 I don't care and uh I mean we immediately accepted the fight so that was that was great I mean frustrating in a way that we prepare for a south for then we get an orthodox guy which is not the end of the world but you know, a certain game plan, and then we go back to the Calvin Gaston, who's a shorter guy, south wall uh, with hard punches. So, I mean, it all worked out perfectly uh, right up until you know, Calvin Gaston cancelled the fight on fight week, which was very frustrating. All right, so now you're mentioning, right, so you have all these opponent changes. Next thing you know, you land, you get Ke- Kevin Gaston. That has to be, obviously, uh, uh, exciting news for you, right, to get a guy like Calvin who's ranked – inside uh or was ranked at one time uh in the division i believe he's still ranked now obviously that f- doesn't happen and you were pretty upset with it right i, I believe you kind of used words like that he took food off the table if i remember quoting you correctly there i know you were pretty upset with it what was it that you were so upset with that and are you guys cool now with with everything that kind of happened there yeah absolutely i mean i have all the respect in the world for calvin gaston he's a he's a he's a pioneer in the sport he's a, he's had some amazing fights like I said, a lot of people said, oh, he's scared. I, I don't believe Calvin Gaston was scared to fight me. I believe Calvin Gaston made the smart decision. Yeah, I'm not saying he never had the injury, but I said, uh, I do believe that it was an injury that didn't occur at the time when he said it. It didn't happen in fight week. It's an injury where he said, listen, he's willing to still take a fight with that injury. And so they were, you know, Calvin really needs to win. He really needs a win. So he wanted to take a easier fight when uh, his opponent pulled out and said, oh, well, get me somebody that I can, you know, that's almost a certain win for him. And they decided to pick me, which is great for me because, uh, I mean, that would have been a big mistake on their part. And I don't know if they watched tape. I don't know what it was. I don't know how that all played out. But, I mean, conveniently, they decided not to take the fight. And like I said, I do believe he was injured, but I don't believe he was injured that needed the operation. And that happened on uh, the fight week. So what I'm saying with that is if he pulled out of the fight, when his opponent pulled out, it would have been the perfect opportunity for him to say, okay, cool, fight's cancelled, I'll get my surgery, do what I have to do. But then ultimately their decision to take me and say they want a fight, they want a replacement, uh, had me give up my opponent to somebody else and then ultimately being left out without any any fight. You know, that's that's uh, not being paid to fight. That's not a that's that's the thing. Like we traveled, I was already in the stage when this happened. The the cost of camps, the cost of uh, accommodating my whole team in the US and flying everybody over, living in a hotel because we come out earlier because of the time zones we we come out quite a bit earlier. So I mean that first couple, that first week that's on your own. You have to pay for that by yourself. 
So, I mean, and never mind that, the fact that I didn't get a fight first, which is terrible because, uh, you know, we already put in all the work. I was already there ready to fight. And uh, basically his decision not to fight made uh, basically just screwed me over. But no, it's, it's, it's not a personal against him. It's, I mean, they did what he had, he did what he had to do for, for his career, but ultimately he screwed me over a little. So, I mean, there's no bad blood, I would say. It's not bad blood, but, you know, now I want that fight 100% because I know they're worried about that fight. I know there was something saying in their head saying, this is not worth it. This is not a fight that we're going to take because he needs a win. So if they thought I was an easy fight and walk over fight, they would probably not have canceled that fight. And hey, who knows, after this fight, that is something that could definitely still be on the table, something to book. I'm sure the fans would like to see it there. Uh, one thing now, before we start getting to these fight specifics here for this fight, I, I just want you to touch on briefly, because you did mention about like the expenses of camp and getting everybody over. It, it's not easy being in a different country when the fights are over here in the United States, uh, right? You were, we were talking before we came on air, your travel is ridiculous to get over to the United States. So just go ahead and tell everybody what this travel is going to be like, right? So you're fighting on July 2nd. Kind of explain the travel procedure just to get over here, to get into the United States and kind of get ready for your camp there on July 2nd. Yeah, well, all the visa admin aside, <laughs> that is, that's one thing being from South Africa. But you know, traveling is not a problem for me. But when, when we, the past two fights in the UFC, we were still in COVID situations. So traveling was really hard. A lot of restrictions, so no direct flights from South Africa to the US. We have 36 hour flights, 10 hour layovers. It's, it's tough, but no, it's 100% worth it. That's why we fly out two weeks or 10 days at least uh, before the event to climatize to different time zones, which is nine time zones to Vegas and South Africa. And uh, right now, I think we have a direct flight, which is a 16 hour flight to either Atlanta or Newark. And uh, from there on, we'll fly to Vegas. So, I mean, that is a lot of travel, but it's, it's not the end of the world. It's 100% worth it. And, you know, it's great to fight in the United States. I, I enjoy fighting there, but, you know, flying all the way there and not having a fight, that's it. All right. So now let's start getting into the fight specifics here. We'll start with your opponent, Brad Tavares. Obviously, a uh, veteran now at this point. He's been in the UFC for a little while. He's fought guys like Israel, Israel Adesanya, the current champion. Robert Whitaker, a former champion, Yoel Romero, uh, title challenger there. So he's fought a lot of the biggest names uh, in the division. Uh, just talk about him a little bit as an opponent, what you've kind of seen out of him over the years here uh, as he's fought and what you're kind of uh, expecting him uh, uh, to present on fight night. Yeah, I mean, uh, Brady Warriors is an absolute, uh, he's, he's an incredible fighter. He's like, I mean, he has 20 or 21 UFC fights. He's fought the best of the best. He uh, and he always comes to fight. Nobody, he's not a walkover for anybody. And uh, yeah, I mean, what, what I expect from him is the same. He hasn't changed his style over the years. Maybe added something here, something there, but he hasn't changed his style. He's going to come for that brawl, and well, that's great. I mean, my last fight was a was a, was a very decorated striker, um, and uh, in Trevor Giles. So uh, I mean, Brad Devoris, he's he's basically fought everybody. So. Uh, he's 35 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, I mean, he's, he's seen it all, he's done it all. And uh, I believe he's on the way down, not on the way up. Uh, with all due respect, uh, I think he is an incredible fighter. He's one of the toughest dudes in the division and really one of the toughest fights that, uh, that, that, that you could have within uh, the top 15. He's really one of those guys, that you know, if you fight him, you know you're going to have a big fight in your hands. It's not going to be just a He's not just going to give up. He's not going to be um, thrown off his game by anything you can do. He has seen it all. He's fought the champion. He's fought the former champion. He's fought multiple title challenges, which is, is great for me because the statement that I can make by beating Brad Tavares and the statement that I will make by beating Brad, Brad Tavares is that the champion couldn't finish him and I'm going out there to finish him. The champion couldn't do it in five rounds and I'm going out there to do it in under three. So uh, before we talk about some future plans there, because you were mentioning how it kind of will open up a lot of doors for you with the win, uh, I do want to talk just a little bit about your training camp so far. Obviously, you're in camp right now. How's your camp been going as you kind of put the final touches on it now before fight night? Yeah, fight camp has been great. I mean, obviously, when I came back from, uh, from, my, from my last fight, but that didn't happen. I spent a few, uh, five weeks uh, centered down in South Florida and when we came back, uh, I mean, I was still in fight shape. I was, my weight was ready. So, I mean, we just had to keep on and make some changes in terms of fighting Brad Tavares. 
as it to any other opponent. But not a lot of changes. You know, I'm focused on my style, not his style. But uh, keep just we had to do maintenance and then peaking at the end of the day, and uh, I feel incredible. I'm injury free. I feel ready to go. Uh, we had one of the hardest sessions today. That's double the fight distance with multiple opponents, and uh, I feel ready to go. I'm. Um, my cats were going great. Uh, we did everything. We checked all the boxes, and uh, it, it'll show on fight time. And this uh, whole travel to Sanford MMA, it's kind of a regular thing for you. How exactly do you balance it then, too? Obviously, I know you're uh, out of South Africa. Your coaches, when you are uh, when you have your fight, are all from South Africa. But how exactly do you kind of uh, go about getting down then to South Florida and spending the time at Sanford MMA and working with those guys uh, as well? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the first time I went, I think it was 2017. And then uh, I went for a couple of times. And then, uh, so it's basically a cross training. So I go there and spend some time over there, uh, get learn from uh, all their expertise. They have an incredible team there. They have a lot of UFC fighters. They have Michael Chandler there. They have Mara Usman. They have a lot of incredibly great fighters over there. And then, of course, Coach Henry Hooft, Craig Jones, wrestling coach. Uh, they have Burns BJJ, which is, uh, I mean, just incredible people to learn from and to it's almost like we do a cross training there where uh i'm i learn stuff from them bring it back with me and just you know just to see a, to see a, a little different view of uh of what the sport in uh what the sport's all about and the sports this sport is just ever evolving and adapt and changing so fast and if you don't adapt to that or if you don't set your eyes to where you can learn from everybody, then you're going to be in big trouble. So it's basically um, how we do it. So I go there for four or five weeks when you don't have a fight schedule and uh, I'll come back to finish off my camp, the, the last eight weeks or six weeks of my camp back here in South Africa. Obviously the last, well, not this year, but the big COVID years, there was two years where South Africa was banned from a lot of countries, uh, United States being one of them. So it was incredibly difficult. So it wasn't really possible to go there. But uh, the time I just spent there again was, was incredible. All right. So now let's start talking about these future plans here a little bit, right? You mentioned that a win kind of opens up a lot of doors for you. Uh, obviously, coming into this fight, he sits, I believe, at number 12. Uh, at the, this is at the time we're recording this anyway. He's ranked number 12 in the world in the middleweight division. Uh, obviously, a win you would expect, I would think, to get you a ranking then. So... Uh, you get the win. Are you expecting to have a number next to your name? And where do you kind of then uh, think you kind of go from there? Because, like you said, it does open a lot of doors for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, after this win, I'm going to get that number 12 spot next to mine. I think that's what's happening. Uh, after this fight, uh, I'll be in the rankings. And then it's uh, a matter of time. Uh, after this fight, uh, I would love to uh, get another big one in before the end of the year. Maybe a gas in maybe whoever. Uh, but hopefully a top 10 opponent and see um, uh, once I step into the top 10, that's two fights away from a title shot at any given moment. So especially uh, with the champ currently almost overlapping everybody in the division, um, they are looking for new, for new blood. They're looking for, for anybody that puts up their hand. And that's what I want to do. I want to put up my hand at the division and show that I'm ready to fight the big dogs like a Brad Tavares, like Calvin Gaston, like anybody in that top 10 that, uh, that I feel comfortable that I feel comfortable that I can beat anybody in that, in that top 10 with all the respect in the world because there's some killers in that division. I just know what, what I have. I just, uh, I like this fight because it's a big fight, but it's also, I mean, I've spent two rounds in total in the UFC uh, cage. So I would like to, to get the experience and find my feet, find my home in the, in the UFC cage, you know, uh, fighting in the UFC for the first time, then your second fight. This third fight is, uh, is by far the best opponent I've ever faced in my career, the highest ranked opponent, but uh, it's also by far the best that I've ever been prepared for an opponent. So I think this is going to set me um, so much. This is going to finally put me on the map as somebody that's a threat to the whole middleweight division. And uh, future, as far as future plans go, my future stretches as far as 2nd of July, becoming number 12 in the world. And uh, after that, it is starting to hunt for that belt. But right now, my focus is solely on Brad Tavares and making sure that I put on a spectacular performance. So you had mentioned there, right, about the current champion, Israel Asanya, kind of starting to lap people and the division kind of needs some new blood. Well, he's actually going to be headlining the card that you're on there, obviously uh, getting some new blood to a degree, right? J.R. Cannonier, I know he's been around for a little while, but 
Uh, first time those guys are squaring off. First time Cannoneers getting the title fight. Just want to get your thoughts on that matchup and how you see that kind of playing out. Yeah, I mean, Jared Cannonier is an absolute beast. Coming all the way from what he weighed, heavyweight, light heavyweight, being successful in both. Coming down to middleweight, uh, I mean, he's just a specimen. But I honestly believe his age is counting against him at this stage. And fighting a guy like Israel Desanya, I think Cannonier has the power advantage. Um in this fight, but I just believe that Izzy is just going to be too, he's just going to be too slick, too quick, too, um, too smart. He's just such a decorated striker that uh, uh, I think uh, that that's going to be, it's going to be really hard for Kananir to, to enter and be able to land those power shots since Izzy is so tall, so long, and he knows how to use his reach. He knows how to stay out of harm's way and he knows how not to get taken down. Uh, we all know, as can say, like Izzy doesn't have wrestling, doesn't have grappling, but up until this point, nobody has, has proven that. Uh, he knows exactly how to, to stay out of range. He knows exactly how to prevent takedowns. And uh, I don't see Kananir being part of the change that I think uh, he's at this stage uh, where he is. He's just too focused, just too quick. Just you know, Kananir being a great fighter, I just think he's, everything that Kananir can do, he's going to do better. So it's interesting with Izzy, right? I think you laid out uh, kind of the blueprint with uh, his fights there perfectly. I did want to actually uh, touch on that a little bit here. Obviously, outside of uh, his loss to Jan Blachowicz, which took place at light heavyweight, as far as one eight, the 185-pound division goes, man, he's just kind of running right through things there. And every time he has a fight, it seems like we try to find like a narrative, right? So like when he fought uh, Marvin Vittori, it was... Well, hey, he just lost to Jan, and Marvin's a big guy, and Marvin could take him down. Well, Marvin couldn't take him down. Now, like, we've got this matchup yeah. here. Well, you know, Jared Cannonier has the power to put anybody out there. He can land that shot that knocks him out, but obviously it's a lot easier said than done. When you look at Israel, is there a, a way of beating this guy, or is this going to have to be a, a, a way of you have to be on that day and he has to be off, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's MMA. And like we said, in my, if you go on stats and our uh, 100 fights, that is, he would win this fight 95 times. But it's MMA. So if one shot lands, the whole game changes. <clears throat> one big takedown, one big shot can change the whole game for, for Izzy or for Kananir uh, in both ways. But yeah, Izzy has done, has done really well and applying his style of kickboxing and striking to MMA and he has a great team behind him, but uh, I think and if, 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 if you were to fight him, uh, not to play into his game, and uh, you have to be extremely fit, you have to be, you have cardio, you have to have the cardio to go five rounds and put up an immense space with a lot of pressure. Uh, you don't want him to, to be, uh, get, gain momentum, you have to be able to stop every momentum he has, either by, uh, by countering or either by getting me up against a fence and uh, being able to, to almost bully him because I don't think he's tall, but I don't think he's the strongest middleweight. I don't think he has a lot of power. He's not a very muscular guy. He's very lean. He's very tall. So almost you have to, you have to make it an ugly dog fight. Uh, but at the same time, be very wary because you can't just go out there throwing going guns blazing because at the end of the day, he's, a, he's like a sniper. He, he finds a spot and he knows where to hit and he, he's very accurate. He throws... Uh, punches from all angles, kicks from all angles. So when you fight easy, you have to be able to go forward and uh, stay focused, but still make it a dog fight. And that's how I believe uh, somebody could be beating easy. If you could see the last Robert Whittaker fight, it's almost like Whittaker did what he needed to get in, but it's, you were so excited to get in that he couldn't do what he had to, to to round off what he just did. He was on easy's back. He should have stayed there. He was on... He had Izzy in a lot of positions where he could have been beneficial, but you know that's easier said than done, like you said. But it's almost like Marvin Vittori did great on getting in on Izzy, but didn't round off his takedowns very well. And that comes down to to cardio, I believe. I believe both everybody, everybody in that top ten is extremely fit, but you need that something extra if you're going to fight Izzy. All right, man. It's been great here today speaking with you. We touched on a lot of different topics there. Uh, just to close us out here, uh, go ahead, plug your social media so people know where to follow you at. You have anybody you got to plug, sponsors, management, uh, teammates, coaches, whoever. Floor is yours. Take it away. Man, thank you so much, guys. Give me a follow on Facebook, Drew Castillo. I to see also Twitter uh, and Instagram, uh, Drew Castillo. Just Drew Castillo. And... Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Just got a call there. <laughs> yeah, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, at Ricky Simplici. Give, give me a follow. And you no, know, my team, my team at CIT MMA, we are a uh, South African born bred team and we are just expanding uh, rapidly. And it's, it's really exciting for me to come out of a small place here, South Africa, not really considered a fighting country at all. And uh, amazing support uh, of global brands, brands like USN Sports Nutrition, uh, sponsoring the whole team and putting in the effort and money and investing in the sport that we love and uh, giving us the opportunity to, to fight and be on the global stage. It's incredible and uh, we're extremely thankful for that and we're changing the game of, of MMA in South Africa and very soon the world. All right, Dreykus, thanks so much for all the time here today, man. Really appreciate it. Best of luck to upcoming fight again. Uh, Dreykus will be fighting Brad Tavares at UFC 276 on July 2nd, so make sure you guys check that out. That it will be the first July pay-per-view of that month. Of course, there is two pay-per-views coming up here in the month of July, so big fights coming up here, and just want to go ahead and thank all of you guys for watching today's interview. If you liked it, please go to the bottom, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't done so already, and keep going to MyMMANews.com for all your MMA content. Great stuff comes out there all seven days of the week. We'll see you later, everybody.